Okay, so today is December the 12th, 2021, and this is our Western Desiderata meeting. And um, well, we were already previously talking about um, certain topics, so whoever wants to start it off. Um, sure, yeah, I, I'd like to discuss a bit of the financial system um, as, uh, as you know what the what the general script is for for good citizens and why that is not good for the citizens that um, that it's purported to be. So uh, the the general idea is um, uh, pretty applicable across various countries. Um, so uh, I'll be l looking at this through the uh, American tax system. But there's, uh, you know, state pensions and uh, socials and things like that in, in many countries, and it's largely cookie cutter um, be between them, uh, at least uh, the, where the, uh, the, the people are joining from on, on these calls most of the time. Um, so I think the, uh, the general idea is um, uh, originally... There were pensions, um, which were defined um, uh, defined con defined benefit plans, I believe. Um, so they they were, you know, uh, y you'd have an unlimited amount of uh, years that you could be alive, and it wouldn't run out, essentially, um, and you could be taken care of. So it was like a, a bit of um, of security blanket so that if you were uh, working for a company, you could have that for, for the long term. Um, and then around 1971 or something, uh, I believe Kodak um, uh, came out with, uh, uh, you know, uh, co-sponsored a bill to, to do what's called a 401k, which is um, essentially a, a retirement plan that um, is designed to essentially make the the company um, less responsible for you, uh, and to n make you responsible for what you invest in. So um, the the challenge there uh, is that um, it, it's often you know taken from you and given to. The, the government will then control it. So you, you can't access the, the funds that, that are pooled in your retirement account uh, without a, a big penalty. And the, the entire idea behind it is essentially that you want to put money tax free, tax defer money now for um, so that while you're in your working years, that you'll be able to withdraw it uh, at a lower tax rate when you uh, retire. Um, and that premise itself is based on the idea that you're planning to be poor when you when you are old. Um, like the, there isn't uh, uh, an idea of that you would build your your skills and assets and stuff so that you'd be get, getting more and more money and you'd be in a higher tax bracket later. Now, historically in the U.S., these are some of the lowest tax rates that, that have existed. Um, and so to think that you're going to get a lower tax rate in, you know, however many years is, uh, is crazy. Um, uh, but also the, uh, the, the, if you were to, invest the money that you have now, you pay the taxes on it and invest it in uh, currently, you would have the, um, the, the capital gains rates, which are typically lower than income rates. But uh, in retirement, they will force you to take your money out. Um, it's called a required minimum distribution. And that will be taxed at regular income rates, which are typically much higher. So they will be, um, it, it's, it's actually a trick 
that um, you know you you will often end up paying more taxes uh, in long term, uh, thinking that you're not paying taxes now, and in the uh, and the government already restricts what you can do with that money. So uh, you know where uh, you you basically have left control to you know what you can what you can do with it. The the terms of the agreement and stuff can be changed at any time by the government. So they could do a bail-in like like Cyprus did and just take your money. Um, so, uh, or they could change the rules and make it so that you have to invest it in government bonds or something like that. Um, but the, the real trick is that uh, over the course of your life, um, so, so you you get a job and you you uh, put put money into your four hundred one k up to some maximum. Uh, there's there's like a, often a four hundred one k match. So it, if there's if your employer will put some money in for you, it's like oh that's free money. Why would you not want that? And the truth is is that the companies that have this four hundred one k match, typically there's a um, uh, they're they're just taking that out of your salary essentially. So they would normally be paying you more, but then they have this conditional money that you have to put it into this, and then they just pay you less, right? So that's uh, uh, it looks like free money, but it was you, your money to begin with, essentially. Um, that they're that they're making now conditional on you doing things. So uh, some of those uh four one k match rules are often. Uh, often evaporate like you have to stay with the, with the company for six years and it has to vest and and these kinds of things I mean, it's not true for every company, but um, But there there are a good chunk of uh, 401k match monies that um, that just evaporate and go back to the company and uh, So the other the other thing is that uh, it's a um, there are limited amounts of funds that you can invest in. So you can't invest in, say, um, you know, assets that you can control. So be that, be that being real estate or some other things that you can force appreciation on, right? You can't go and like install a carport <laughs> or something like that and make make more money. You what you can't. Um, you you have to invest in things like stocks, bonds, and mutual funds that are provided by your employer, and um, those typically are uh, uh, kickback scheme type of things with large large fees. So uh, the mutual funds will will be maybe have a one percent fee or something like that over the course of of your uh, working career. Now that sounds like nothing, but over the course of your working career, that'll t that'll steal two thirds of your money um, that you've invested. So you, uh, what what ends up happening is, uh, uh, I mean, he's done videos on on rates before and how the banksters use those to fool people um, into thinking that the the theft is the theft is a boiling frog thing that people don't notice, right? Um, and, but this is, this is even worse than that because it's, um, anything that you put into your foreign for one K is not your money anymore. Right. And it's, uh, it's also, you can't control it. You can't use it at, at any time. You can't, um, uh, and you, and the more you put into it, the less control over your life you have to be able to break out of a rat race situation. So you, you have uh, essentially to stay in the employment, you know, uh, uh, wage slavery business, to, uh, because you you never accumulate more than than um, subsistence for your for your life. As long as you're putting it away into the four hundred one k, that's not available to pool your money and compound uh, outside of the four hundred one k system. So that that one percent uh, fee. Um, uh, goes into you know stocks and stuff like that. So um, the the mutual funds will take that out. So that'll take all, already two thirds of your money. 
but then there's this, uh, you know, this religion around um, the, the financial industry about uh, compound interest and have uh, how that's like, uh, you know, the, they'll say that Einstein said that it was the strongest force of the universe. Uh, Einstein never said that, and it was just a it was just a bullshit thing that they had for marketing that they said Einstein said that. So don't believe that. Um, and also the um, they'll say that the S and P five hundred has returned an average of like seven or eight percent over uh, the lifetime of of um, you know investing in it. Now that's also a scam because the uh when they report that seven or eight percent they're reporting average returns and average returns are not the kind of money you get from your investment so uh as an example if you were to uh in uh speculate um with you know uh say a hundred dollars and you buy a hundred dollars of you know uh something Bezos did, and then uh, it goes uh, down uh, 50% and then goes back up 50%, even though the average returns would be zero, you only have $75 of your original 100 by the end because you cut that 50, you cut that 100 into by half and then it went up by half again you that's that's 70 goes up to 75 so it it will actually shrink your money over time much faster than the headline rates they never give you the real returns they only report the average returns and the average returns can be crazy low cuz it it bas basically penalizes any volatility in the market so you you'll just be it'll just be chewing away at your 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 uh, your money over that time, and if you're not paying attention to to it carefully, they it, it's very hard for you to to understand um, because you'll think, hey, look, I've got this big nest nest egg, and maybe I've made a million dollars investing over the course of my life, and and uh, that's great. But what you wouldn't know is how many other houses and and uh, you know Lamborghinis you would have if you hadn't done that, right? Um, it's that uh, so so they'll fool you. And the thing is with with that um, the the S and P five hundred also kicks out the um, companies uh, that that were underperforming. So this is this is another thing like the. Uh, if you look at the uh, the Motley Fool stocks or something, they'll they'll have like uh, picks of of stocks for you that that beat the market. And what they do is they just kick out the ones that didn't perform and call it the same index and uh, pretend that you would have if you had invested with them that that's the return you would have gotten. And truth is, you you don't get that return. Almost everything that you read about is um, is predatory against you. So you you try to educate yourself, and you get caught in these little honeypot traps of uh, you know what's the what's the right thing to do? Oh, you should get a safe, stable job with with good benefits and uh, max out your four hundred one k, and um, uh, and all of those things are bad for you essentially so when at uh over the course of your life if it if two-thirds of your um retirement funds have been taken from you and they're inaccessible to you um uh then and then at the end you get forced to pay more taxes on it than you would have uh if you had just paid taxes on it from the get-go or removed yourself from the tax net um by renouncing your citizenship or what what have you you know that there's um y you have uh essentially just spent your entire working life like um uh, essentially paying into wall street and making wall street and and the the banks and the government you know that that dark triad <laughs> um 
uh, benefit off of your back, off of your labor. So, and a lot of people don't think about tax optimization and these kind of things because you know it's not, you know, uh, it's it's boring and and uh, it requires a lot of research. But over the course of your life, you are um, that's your single largest expense. So if you're paying thirty five percent of your stuff. Um, uh, on on that one expense, and you never consider about how you can how you can lower that or um, work with it. It's um, it's absolutely uh, you know negligent in a way because it, that's like working three or four months of your year purely as a slave for for the government, like you, with no benefit to yourself. Um, and, and that's a, uh, I, I mean, it would be one thing if the government was doing a, a good job and not, you know, uh, doing all the things that it does, but, um, but yeah, if, if you're, you, you can make a judgment call whether you want to support that hierarchy or not. Um, but, but essentially it's, a. Uh, it's also like the 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 script of getting a safe, stable job with good benefits is a lie as well. Because if you were to have a business with only one customer, you would say that's a, an extremely risky business. That's unsafe. But that's exactly what employment is. You have one customer, and it can they can vanish at any time, right? Um, and so the only thing to be safe and stable is to get multiple streams of income, get multiple uh, employers, get multiple customers, have a business. And the other thing about a business is that uh, there are no ways to optimize your taxes as an employee um, other than these retirement programs and maybe having a kid or something. But it's 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 all negligible. Whereas uh, with a business, you you get taxed post. Uh, you, you get to dec figure out your taxes after um, after spending them. So if you if you invest in things, then you say, okay, I had this much uh, profit, and then you get taxed on that. Whereas if you're an employee, you get taxed immediately before you get your money. Right? It gets taken out of your paycheck. Right, so those those are those are vastly different systems that allow you to um, essentially control your life better. So I, I think the the uh, the the tricky thing essentially is if you follow the script of the the system, you will spend your entire working life um, maybe eke out like. A meager, meager retirement, uh, especially if you if you get student loan debt and things like that, where you you're enslaved to pay that back over the course of your lifetime. Like my mom will not will die with her student loan debt; she'll never be um, unindentured, and uh, it's it's just an enormous amount of. Uh, I mean, it's an American problem more than it is a European one, but it's a uh, uh, essentially you will run out of, um, it, you will never get ahead in your life if you follow what the system tells you to do. You have to break the system's uh, script if you are going to, uh, to escape from it. Okay, so this is a big thing. This is a wild big thing. Um, and I think we should all put it under the heading of, uh, you know, the extinctionology and how you actually navigate the collapse of the financial system, because uh, the very it's the very first thing you have to tackle. So if you are a deep doomer and you know that uh, you know the system's un it's undergoing collapse as we speak, you have to work like a ninja to to get through just to the point where you get through the collapse or the flipping, right? So before you even talk about 
how you survive the flipping it. You have to probably survive the collapse. And a large part of it is finance. So we should address this, even though people might get a little bit bored with the subject. But uh, we as, a, as the Extinction Army, if we're actually going to survive the, the future, our best bet, I think, is to do it as a collective um, and to to uh, muddle through it together. So it's it's the same kind of thing that you need all the way down the line, and that's mutualism. Um, and so, yeah, I I I have a lot of ideas about Jash and support all of us. The the problem is is most people have the their own incomes now, and they're not really kind of focused on you know, the kind of come and collapse and stuff. So let, let's get focused on it and start from the point of view of um, just uh, okay, start from from scratch, like where you, you're coming from about investments and stuff. So, okay, first of all, banner headline, this is the same as medical advice, is that basically we are not financial experts and we can, we're not uh, qualified or licensed to give you financial advice. So if you any advice that we give you is just our own thoughts and it's, you know, just uh, buyer beware and uh, past performance may not indicate future prospects and all the other stuff. Uh, you miss at your own risk if you listen to any of our advice because we're not giving you professional financial advice. Okay. Yeah, I'm not giving you professional advice. <laughs> you bloody, yeah, you bloody, you're going to need some fucking you, you're going to have, there's so many things to survive the coming years and survive the flipping. There's so many things you have to ace. It's, it's, you know, worse than the Egyptian gods trying to make it through the sticks to the underworld. But anyway, this is part of the value of the de death that you have to get through. It's, it's, this is my thought. To it. So, there were, so a simple thing just on, just to level set for everybody. The, what a 401k is, is it, it was a loop on the law. That's why I call a 401k it was a, a special section of the law. And some some accountant noticed and realized, hey, that gives you a loophole to actually uh, put money tax free on, in in the stock market. He made a big fuss about it, and then everybody got on board because the the company suddenly realized they didn't have to accumulate pension funds. They could just, but you know, do matching contributions to a 401k and then you go on the stock market. What they were doing is basically transferring the risk onto the employee. So the 401k, you have an IRA or a 401k in the UK. The, um, uh, an IRA is a self-managed 401k. 401k is managed by a third party. It's the same in Australia and I think New Zealand. The, the, you have a super fund. And so that is, uh, is really, you don't have access to the money. You have a professional investor. They steal money from fees, some of them vast amounts, but most people try and get an <coughs> index-linked fund with a 1% fee. And as says, you get reamed because they trust that nobody can do maths and compounding. So, okay, so so what is going on here is pretty much what Ryan said in Australia, it's, a, it's not so much in the, the UK um, and Europe because they still have the concept of um, a pension. Uh, and they like pensions because, like Robert Maxwell, you can you can use the penny. Um, governments hate pensions. Um, and the reason is because economists and governments hate pensions uh, because any savings are counted against the productivity of the of the country. So all, all politicians are there for. Activists take note. Excel, are you listening? All politicians are there for is to protect GDP growth. That's it. They're not there for civil rights. They're not there for justice. They're not there for anything else. It's just to protect GDP growth. Why do you need GDP growth? Because the people that own the country, the financiers, need a regular return on income. So they, they have to have GDP growth. That's why we will never, ever transition to anything other than this economy. That's why we will never have degrowth. And, um, you know, it's, it's basically this, the, the country has to grow. Uh, it's, it's an imperative. It's built into the system. It doesn't matter if you're communist, China, they're under this regime. So the uh, so effectively, we go through this. There's no, there's no transition to a green economy. Green growth is a myth. 
And so get get this through your thick skull is that that that's all politicians can do. And you have to now negotiate it. That is the, um, so how, how do you pull this off? Well, it's going to be fucking difficult, right? It's going to be amazingly difficult. And let's start with the first thing. By the way, just a simple thing is the one thing you should do, you're American. I'm not sure about Australia now, but um, if you're American, you should max out your, your HSA. So that's a health account. So the health savings account is, is, what, is a loophole. <laughs> And it's it's um, the reason why a health saving is ripping you off is because big pharma or the healthcare industry, they got uh, they got a concession uh, to allow people to when the healthcare industry gets all the money in an HSA. HSA is the health savings account. I mean, it means you, you can just defer money that you can then use for health. And so everybody knows you need that money at some stage. And so you put it in an HSA, they have a look for similar stuff in Australia and stuff like that. But uh, an HSA will use that money and you will use it tax free because you will definitely need medical, uh, some, some medical procedure coming up. So HSA, good. Um, 4K, like Ryan says, is con game. Now, and uh, the con game is to stop savings because um, the savings in, uh, are frozen capital. If everybody saved, the GDP would go to zero. So they, they uh, and also um, the balance of payments, kind of like whatever you save, uh, the government is a debtor to you. And the whole game is who's who's the debtor. And we're all debtors. So the workers are debtors. We, we, we're debt slaves, right? Uh, Mark said wage, wage slaves, but uh, he didn't really understand them. Now it's very obvious we're debt slaves. So it was always about debt, like David Graeber, readeth, you know, debt the last 5,000 years. So, okay, so now how do you negotiate this? Well, here's the, the problem. Oh, just one more thing on the, the thing what Ryan was saying is, in case you think, well, you know, tax is good and goes for putting down roads and exploring space and doing science and giving Peter Dayzak money to do bioweapons research and shit like that, it doesn't. It's an absolute drop in the bucket. There are only three things that your tax dollar goes for. It, it goes for the military, right? This huge white elephant that's belching CO2 and cannot stop, uh, basically. It goes for uh, a Medicare and the, the VA, and all the basically uh, socialized medicine. And then that goes through to the healthcare industry, and that's you know kind of double the, what the rest of the world pays. So Americans being ripped off, and then the other thing is repayment on the national debt. What's repayment on the national debt is the central bankers on Jekyll Island in 1913, the, the Federal Reserve Act, the, the federal bank, uh, the financiers took over the government. That's what they effectively did. And then they went around the world. And the last was the Bank of Japan, but they got the Bank of Japan too. And uh, everywhere they they decoupled the so central banks from the politicians, telling the world that they're saying, well, you can't have the let the politicians, ha uh, you know, the have the purse strings because otherwise they just spend their way into popularity to get elected. So and if you're going to have stable prices and lack of monetary inflation, then you need central bankers. That was what they said. What they really meant was, uh, we only give you money at like 6%. So the way the monetary system works is the federal bank and the central bank in your country will all be the same. Um, the Bank of England gives money to the treasury uh, and then and the, the charge 6% interest. Who? The federal bank is not federal. It's not a bank. Um, uh, the federal bank is not, uh, and it doesn't have any reserves. All it's there is a vehicle to shield who the real owners are. The real owners are secret, but they're not really secret. Everybody knows who they are. They're, they're the big five banks. And the big five banks are owned by now, they're owned by uh, all the hedge funds. So it's basically, yes, so I'm sorry, it's conspiracy, and it's conspiracy to keep you running on the treadmill. So they struggle to make you sure you can't save. The same way as people in Auschwitz, there's you know, people in a gulag from accumulating food. 
because if you accumulate enough food, you can do an escape. So they they got very careful that you can't do an escape. It's all geared away to stop slaves hoarding, and so that's that's why you can't save. That's why interest rates are zero, borrowing rates are huge, and credit card debt is monstrous. Um, and, and so that's the way they make sure that they keep you working, right? That's uh, they, okay. So now, given this background, is what's about to happen? Well, there's a labor shortage, right? When there's a, a labor shortage. This is a foundation for the central banks and the, the government. The what's uh, happening is they ne they need to stimulate economy because of the the lockdowns and the slowdown to GDP. Um, so they they've been doing quantitative easing. That's printing money at, at an extraordinary rate. It's never been attempted in history, anything like this. It always ends up in the same place. You can go and look at the South Sea bubble. You can go and look at the French assignat. It, it's uh, the Zimbabwe dollar. It's it's just a way of printing their debt into, into the ground. So they print their obligations into the ground. It's the very first thing that Darius did. And Darius is probably the first guy that started this game invented a currency so so what they are doing now is inflation starting to take off and then is going to cost Biden his job and it's going to see trump in the white house in 2024 there's they they're absolutely boxed in there's nothing they can do uh, but stimulate the economy through the banks they give the banks money hope that the banks will then lend it on. That's what trickle down is. It's not trickle down from the rich to the poor. It's trickle down from creditors to borrowers. And the the banks are not really interested in the average Joe Sapp because he's not he, he's not a good risk and he's not returning much. Everything that's returning bubble. So this is where it gets very very dangerous because there's an everything bubble now. Now it's going to translate into high Wages. You can see that unionizing in Amazon and all of this kind of stuff. Um, what's when wages go up, that translates to inflation. So they doubly fucked. Great resignation has made people withdraw their labor, and increasingly people are disaffected. So there's going to be unrest, and there's going to be strikes, and there's going to be uh, there's going to be problems, labor problems. You can go back to the 70s and quickly see what what we're in for, and so. And this is all over the world, by the way. So when uh, they they uh, when workers demand more wages, um, everybody all over the world there's a labor shortage because people are just pissed off, and so uh, this whole thing pandemic's taking its toll. Uh, so uh, when the um, uh, labor gets gets uh, shirty, um, they uh, they demand more wages. Uh, they can't give them more wages because that translates to inflation. But at the same time, uh, people are raising prices unilaterally because there's shortage, supply side short, uh, supply side shortages, right? So the government's completely boxed in. They're seeing, uh, you know, particularly higher prices at the pump and oil and things like that. Energy prices they, that's translating all the way through um, into uh, consumer prices, the consumer price index going up, and then what's what. Uh, um, so the workers are going to demand more and more in terms of wages. If they give them that that extra money, it fuels uh, prices and uh, and not so much earnings. There's a lag in the in the system. So okay. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just painting the picture of what you have to survive that's coming down the pipe, like really, really soon. So uh, now, uh, what it appears. The average Joe doesn't get any of this. The reason is there's a big divide in who you are and what you are. And this is the first problem for the extinction Extinctionati, is everybody thinks they are in a different circumstance. And the system encourages you to think you're in a different circumstance. But we're not. We're all debt slaves together. So, okay, so let me, let me explain why. If you're an older generation, then you look at this. And you see this huge inflating real estate bubble all over the world. And you say, I'm getting richer. I'm getting a wealth effect. I'm, I'll be able to retire sooner. And it's like, no. What you're seeing is the value of your currency decline.
decline. So Zimbabwe and now Mugabe uh, is bankrupt, like all governments are. Um, then uh, currently, uh, then, then uh, Mugabe just starts printing money. He just you know it says like roll the printing prices, and um, the Zimbabwe dollar is going through the floor. Now, if you own property in Salisbury or Bulawayo or whatever, then the you're saying, you know, I'm getting richer and richer. Look at this. And you're saying the same thing about your 401k. Now, the, old, the boomers don't give a shit. They think they're laughing. They, they're looking at property here in Greece and they're buying boats because they, they, they have, they're assuming that they're getting richer and richer because the stock market keeps on going up and the, uh, the property market keeps on going up. But it's not. It's the currency going down. The purchasing power of the dollar is going down and they can't see it because they, they're not earners. The guys that can see it are the youth, and then they see that it's getting harder and harder to earn a buck. It's getting shitter and shitter, and the the will to do it is getting you know less and less, getting eroded. People are saying like, "I'm sick of this game," and uh, and also coincidentally, people are starting to understand the financial system. the The youth is gradually starting to realize: a) there are conspiracies, and two, that basically the financial system is the mother of them all, and so they they. Starting slowly, the young people are starting to get that the, that it's all a big con game, and so the whole game is falling apart. So where does this end up? Well, history history is re replete with examples of exactly where this ends up. It ends up in violent revolution, and soon, right? So so, okay. Now, how do you negotiate this with um, as the extinctionati? Uh, I'll tell you this right now, it ain't going to be fucking easy. <laughs> so let's discuss a few strategies. Um, a good one, okay, so I, I would suggest that we try and stick together and help each other out. And if you make money, especially if you make money out of the advice I give you, then I expect you to return it, not to me, but to everybody in the Extinction Hardy. And so basically it's just think basically it's mutual support so so okay so the so okay so now how it works is like imagine this is it's better to have a diversified strategy it's better that you don't agree with me it's better that nobody agrees with me and th they think they have other ideas um but the very first idea you need to get rid of i think in my views is what ryan was saying you can't be a good citizen and, and get through this because uh, the the stock market's gonna gonna burst. It's a it's a monstrous bubble, right? And uh, it, it's gonna crash. You might not see it crashing, but it, as it goes up, it's effectively crashing because it's hollow. It's actually the you know it's it's only about ten stocks uh, on the Dow and all the thing that they're reporting as you know the, as Ryan was saying these indexes like the Motley Fool index going up is that it's uh, it's only a very few companies. And, and they rotate them. Uh, so it's like switching bets on a horse race, depending on who's in front. It's a complete scam. If you look at the majority, the majority's, um, I mean, real majority, you know, apart from about 10 super stocks, um, you know, all, all the, the, what do they call them? The fast things, the Facebook, Apple, whatever shit. Um, Bang. Uh, those, those, Fang, yeah, Fang, uh, and so apart from the Fang stocks and stuff, the the they the just uh, it's a Ponzi scheme. They're just getting more and more, but everything's hanging on the Fang stock. So the so but the real meat and potatoes thing is is really got it kicked in the nuts. And so you'll see things like I I wouldn't think uh, you know guys like Elon Musk are going to make it through this because he's trying to do real <laughs> real bricks and mortar. Kind of old style enterprise, which is actually produces shit and does all real old fashioned stuff like produces profits. There's no profit in in actually making shit anymore. There's only profit in making you know having paper because paper generates paper. Riches make people richer. So, so Elon Musk and those guys they can only make money to the extent that they're circulating paper. So they get government subsidies and they recirculate them and stuff and they're, they're making money but nobody's making you know mousetraps and uh, getting rich on them and certainly in an inflationary environment that ain't gonna happen 
So, uh, you know, so uh, it's it's all these people that are making money, particularly on derivatives. And like I've told you before, there's thirty dollars by my last count. There's thirty dollars in the derivatives market. That's side bets on one dollar in the real market, which is the actual horse. <laughs> that they're betting on. Um, so this cannot go on. This cannot go on. It's basically it's eating itself out from the inside and all the signs are there already. So what do you do? Do you go out and buy Bitcoin? No. Bitcoin is an NSA sting operation. It was only ever designed to see who was trading on the dark web with it. That's all it was for. It's since then all the other blockchain and stuff, currencies and stuff, they're all Ponzi, right? So they all exactly the same scheme as the bankers are doing. They just, you know, they just latecomers on the very same game that the guys pulled on Jack Alive. Right. So uh, you, you, I mean, here's the problem. It's it, you're going to need nerves of steel to negotiate this and not be suckered at the final, uh, final post. You see, because I'll tell you something like Bitcoin is a load of crap and um, it's going to get shut down. And, you know, a Bitcoin enthusiast will tell you, Hugh's full of crap. Um, and look, I made a million uh, last month. How much did you make? Ha ha. He's an idiot. Okay. So, so the way this word game works is like a, a, a mind the size of Newton's got burnt in the South Sea bubble. So the South Sea bubble was uh, the bubble of the time and Ponzi scheme. And Newton told everybody that it's a bubble, it's a Ponzi scheme, and told them how it worked. And they all kind of listened to him because he was Isaac Newton. And then Isaac Newton lost his shirt on the South Sea bubble. And you say, how did that happen? And he said, he lost his nerve. He got, he got sick of, of telling people, you know, they're being really stupid and this can't go on and it's all going to burst. And they just told, eventually started selling, Isaac, you're a fucking idiot. I'm richer than you are. How much money did you make? And eventually it got to him so badly that right at the top of the market, he went and <laughs> invested heavily and immediately it popped and uh, was proven right and lost his shirt. So the, the problem with this thing is you, you, you have to have, I mean, it's worse than not getting the jab and telling everybody like, oh, no, I know better than the world. It's like you, you get the stupidest fuck you know um, your enemies are going to ridicule you and say that you're an idiot because they've made money like crazy on tulip bubbles, on, on tulips or whatever. And that's this way. Go and have a look at the tulip bubble. There's a very good book on this way. Mac, Mackey's um, the, the Wisdom of Crowds. No, the, wisdom, the madness of and about, about the tulip bubble. And you'll see <laughs> psychologically, it's just the devil. It's absolutely the devil because you, you need the fortitude of Job to stare this in the in the and watch you know dipshit friends of yours at school and stuff uh, come and tell you that they made out like a bandit and they're going to buy a yacht and stuff and you you just have to look at them and you put your poor ass you're doomed and you don't know it but but yeah all I'm saying is I I would never be able to convince you with my words now of the wisdom of this um, so yeah uh, so what to do about it I I would say um diversify and just do a little bit if you see if you get absolutist about it and you listen to Hugh and you say like Hugh you bloody bastard I you know this stupid idiot friend of mine who's a complete village idiot is now richer than Bill Gates because he bought, got Bitcoin and I didn't get Bitcoin he told me not to. so this is what I'd say is is get some flipping Bitcoin <laughs> just just do a little bit of any one of these things right and I'm saying do it collectively. So if if you think Hugh's absolutely wrong and Bitcoin's fantastic and Satoshi's Jesus, uh, yeah, okay, then go and get it. If you make out like a you know like a billionaire, then then spread it amongst the extinctionity and then do it. Um, you know, with everybody do a different strategy. So okay, so I would tell you don't buy Bitcoin. Go ahead if uh, maybe it's a smile. Just do a little bit just to, from psychologically, you can stop yourself, you know, 
beating yourself up because you're missing out on an opportunity. But, okay, so what I would say is, is gold and silver, a big gold bug. Uh, now, what's, but again, you have to be very, very cool because what a, a blockchain enthusiast will tell you is you're going to get burnt with, with gold and silver because they're going to they're gonna seize it. So, uh, my money, all these guys, they're absolutely right. It's real money. Gold and silver is real money. Um, even more so silver because it has utility and, you know, they need it in all the EVs and stuff. But the uh, here's the, the thing. They are going to seize it. So they, they're already seizing gold in, in effect by just doing price controls. So they manipulate the price of the gold just outrageously. It doesn't need, it, it is no riff in, on price discovery or availability of, um, of bullion in the market. It's just crap. And, uh, you know, the Basel III thing says they have to change the accounting rules so the banks will know, the bullion banks who are the guys who manipulated all of this can no longer effectively manipulate the gold with certificates and stuff after December. So, yeah, I would, I would get into that gold and, and bullion. Uh, so now, is bullion going to take off? Maybe, maybe not. You see, the, the, the government cannot have bullion taken off. Bullion competes with their scam. In other words, they're giving you fake money and all the children accept it because they're dipshits. But you see, if you have real money, as soon as uh, anybody sees through the game or the game falls apart, you're a serious threat to the mafia. So it's kind of like, you know, you, you are the rich guy on the block um, and you have real money and they they are the scam artists. The scam artists are going to come after you when everybody sees through their scam. And they're the ones that have all the guns. Do you remember that one third of the revenue they collect is for the military? Now you know why. <laughs> it all comes down to a barrel of a gun. So the value of the dollar is intricately based on uh, the firepower of the U.S. military. So that's one of the reasons why you can never go green because they the, the they can never wipe into a solar panel and wind farm friendly green utopia death machine. So they, they have to run on the fuel. So it's strategic. That's why you'll never keep the oil in the ground. It's, 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 it represents more than energy. It represents power. And it represents the financial system. And why? Because it all goes into an, a, you know, a fighter jet, in effect. So, and fuels an aircraft carrier. So the so so basically the you can so here's a tip for you right away, you can get into security things. So you can uh, you can get if you lost the stock market, you you want to get in, want to ride these bubbles. So if you ride these bubbles, you ride them real careful. It means you have to be really really into it. You can't dabble and check your stocks once once a month. I wouldn't recommend that. It's effectively you electing to catch a knife, as they say on Wall Street. Catch a falling knife. But uh, if you would, the way to, to gamble, you're gambling, right? Understand that you're gambling. It's could be Las Vegas. Now, if you want to do that, the way to do it is uh, you can get in and out of the property market without fees and without deposits and without interests and stuff. You just go to REITs, real estate investment trusts. So REITs are... Um, Ways you can get into the stock market by actually just buying stocks in various companies, that do commercial real estate or to um, residentials or something like that. But they're essentially, you know, a collective of homeowners. Uh, in effect, they're, they're basically doing what individuals do with their house. They're just doing as an institution. So it's very cool because you could sell a REIT tomorrow, you can short a REIT. So the, you want to make an absolute fucking fortune, you get the you get, you get the turn on the reads. So it means that you ride the property bible up, and you get it on the minute, and then you short like crazy. You keep a big balance in the trading accounts. You have a margin trading account. Then as soon as the reads drop, don't get this wrong, because if you go short on reads, <laughs> they will eat you up. And they will start paying dividends to punish you for, for being short, right? But anyway, you, there's, if you can ride REITs down, oh, my God, some of the 
great fortunes have been made on that trade. So anyway, uh, I think that's, especially if you can ride a flashback. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, a, a lot of people get confused around um, uh, uh, investing um, versus uh, speculation, gambling, uh, essentially. And um, there's there's a big difference. Uh, if you're investing in uh, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, um, REITs, you are that's not investing. That's speculation. That's gambling. Um, and uh, if you uh, are, and I think another thing is you, you need to know what what the purpose of of your asset allocation is. So for gold, I would see that more as like an insurance. Uh, policy where you're not really using that as like uh, a way to generate income uh, as much as uh, you know insurance on financial collapse or or like just a, a hedge against um, you know inflation or something. Um, uh, it's insurance against theft of of government theft. So yeah. the government is stealing through you know uh, rent inflation and and so. They, they, if you get gold bullion and you stick it under the bed, uh, don't put it in a in a safety box with a bank because when the shit hits the fan and you really need gold, is the banks are going to be closed, right? So you you literally have to put it under the bed. But the, the, the um, it's uh yeah they they you see, it's a protection against them stealing. So the government are thieves; they're just crooks, um, and they're just the mafia. So here's the problem, is that eventually they have all the guns so they can come around to your house and collect the gold physically when, when the game's off. Everybody understands the game. They can do the bail-ins. They can, they, all of it is just clever tricks while the sheep are asleep. But if the sheep ever catch up or they run out of sheep to slaughter, uh, they will come. Eventually, they'll, you know, the mask will come off. They'll come and knock on your door to get all in. So uh, you, you, and why? I mean, I'm not literally. I'm being figurative here. They don't literally knock on your door to take your bullion. They take it by just saying you'll have the death penalty if you found with an ounce of gold on you, <laughs> and they fix the price of gold at thirty-five dollars. They did it already, so they will do it again. Uh, they did it in nineteen thirty-three. So the the, um, the they will come for your gold and silver. Um, so you, so here's the thing. You, I hope I'm painting the picture of how what you have to do and why I say you have to be a ninja because you have to jump logs. You, you can't pick a strategy to get through the, the coming financial collapse. You, you have to time it like a ninja. Now, if you timed it right, man, you could become a very rich bastard. Um, but most people will time it wrong. That's why I say, as an extinction hunter, you must think in, more in terms of an investment pool. And then, you know, you, okay, if you have enough people and we grow the extinction already enough, um, they, you will have enough people that some come through. So the way it works is a, a few people will make out like extraordinary, like bandits. It's gambling, literally. So, we, we, you know, the, okay, let's put in context of gambling because this is a very good thing. So you're in Vegas, let's call it relax. In Vegas, the house wins because basically double zeros or they've, they've done payout, they have a payout ratio and stuff. And so the house always wins, right? So in this case, it's not quite like gambling because the house is going to lose, right? The house is about to burn down, right? So it's like you, you we all say as the extension army have chips on the table, uh, say on the roulette table, and you know somebody is going to come out. There's going to be one in 36 or hopefully not double zeros. And you see, one of us is going to make out like a bandit. Uh, you, the smart thing is to share it with all the rest um, so that we, we uh, indemnify ourselves. That's the one thing the government can't fuck you up on is, is um, mutuality. So one of the ways to survive all of this is a mutual club. So the best thing of all is to have a parallel economy. And that's why I made Geodo and, and the money thing, which I can never get off the ground. But the uh, if you have um, a parallel economy uh, and and we can have loose affinities with you know, permaculturalists and Bitcoin enthusiasts and stuff like that. But you see, if one thing that the government cannot fuck with is if 
uh, we have a mutual system in, uh, amongst ourselves. So, so if uh, I owe you, you know, a hundred euros, um, that that's uh, an obligation that the government can't fuck with. And in fact, it's a currency. I could trade it amongst the rest of us, right? And then um, that's very strong. The, 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 there's nothing, you see, there's nothing, the government can't come around with a gun and say like, you know how, um, you know, you know how you got an agreement with Sophie that like, you know, you owe him, uh, you owe a hundred uh, euros and you have an interest rate of 10%. Well, I say at the barrel of a gun, that's illegal. And you say, okay, <laughs> you laugh and carry on. There's nothing they can do about it. So, all the other things they can do stuff about, but if you have an informal arrangement like that, it's 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 the reason why they don't like the mafia and they don't like the Cray twins and they don't like. Uh, it's basically it's competition for them, and the way it's uh, serious for them is because it's informal and parallel. You know, in Greece they use the drachma <laughs> in this kind of closed community. So. It's, to have a closed community. The ideal thing would be to have everything you need within that community. So you'd have medical services, you'd have um, permaculture, you would have like, you know, transport and all of these things, all the stuff we need to survive. Uh, if it's in your closed community, you can laugh through the collapse, right? Yeah. So deep adaptation while they, you know, stringing their violins and weeping and doing all this emotional shit, they should be talking about stuff like this. And so I think we should. We should it's a good thing to open this conversation and we should start thinking this way. Yeah. I, I think um, the, the other, the other, um, stuff to say here. yeah, yeah. I wanted to talk about the other side of uh, uh, other than the speculation and gambling. So there's the investment. So if you, if you want to understand what investment is, just think about what will a bank lend loan you money for. Um, so if a bank will not loan you money to um, to play on the stock market, right? They won't do that. They'll laugh you out of like you're you're getting a loan to to go to Vegas, right? It's, they'll just laugh you out of the office. But if you have a uh, a business plan for for a business that you want to buy you, you see there's a there's a laundromat or something and you want to buy it you say okay here are the cash flows here are the um here are the assets the liabilities and then all these things you bring that to the bank and uh they give you money now this is actually where the money money supply enters the 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 market really is from the bank to you they just wish it into existence say no, no, actually they won't Say that? They, they won't. They won't they loan won't. money. <laughs> they, they don't give money. No, if you want to go and buy a franchise or something, they won't give you the money. They, um, the, they, those are long ago have become bad bets. Those were, that's what they kind of teach you in school is what, how the, you know, that's how they teach in all the videos in the, from the 50s about how the economy works. It doesn't actually work. Like, if you actually go, give it a go. Go, go down to your local. Uh, Bank of America or Chase or something like that, and say, "Hey, I want a McDonald's franchise." No, no, no. It's, you. Because, it, it's, it's for a franchise system. business, they won't do that. But for if you're if you're buying an existing cash flowing business with an SBA loan, then the bank will do it because the government will underwrite it. So um, they get to sell their loan right oh, away. Oh yeah, but how many of those are? How many of those are there? That's the problem. Is where are you going to find somebody selling a business that's making a profit in this? Uh, from from boomers, really. Uh, there's there most of the people who own businesses want to retire now, and um, the there there are people who have had solid, you know, steady businesses for for a long time. I'm not talking about the the kind of startup stuff of trying to create um, a unicorn. I'm talking about you know, regular cash flowing businesses, things that have functioned. Um, ah, yes, no, that's true. No, but, yeah. but yes, uh, yes, you will get co-funding. Uh, yes, but this is a good idea. Yeah. Um, okay, but the best uh, money, the best money of all is three F's money, what they call, or four F's money. That's friends, family, fools and physicians. That's the joke. Um, uh, but for startups uh, and entrepreneurs and that, the four F's money is the good money. 
uh, all, the, all that's the only good money you'll get ever get all and and maybe uh, SBA loans and stuff like that but they, they're small they're tiny what they assume is that you you know um, you're an affirmative action group and they're doing um, it's a diversity kind of initiative and so uh, you know if, if basically if if to be a bit pejorative if if you're a black lesbian woman who wants to start um, a manicuring business, you'll get an SBA, SBA loan of about 10 grand. So, it's, so I'm, if, I'm not, if you want to go and start Tesla, you're not, you're not going to do it. <laughs> so that, let, let's, let's be clear. I don't advocate getting a loan to start a business because of the startup phase of a business. Nine out of 10 businesses that are started die in the first five years. And uh, 99 out of 100 die in the first 10. And you are, if you are in this rat race, like you are, you are going to be a statistic if you try to do that. I've done that myself, and it, and Hugh's done that himself. And we are statistics. Don't do it. Um, but there are businesses that have survived the startup phase, and those are the ones that you know, for the price of a house, you can get. Uh, leverage and buy a business that already is cash flowing, that has already survived the startup phase, where the systems are in place. And if we can bring value to those businesses to make them grow, um, then it it does make sense for a bank to in, to invest. Um, and and this is the big thing about uh, what people don't understand about debt. So there's the these Dave Ramsey and people like that are saying like get out of debt, have no debt. Like uh, pay off all your credit cards, like have nothing. But the the people who are really the owners of of us, they know all about debt, so they get deep in debt. So e Elon Musk, you mentioned him earlier. Instead of paying taxes, Elon Musk pays interest on the loan. So that's three percent instead of you know thirty five percent. So what he'll do is he yeah, but, has his stock. But, but, but no, no, but he's already made it, right? So I, no, uh, no bank, like the best offer I ever got in my life was Wells Fargo gave me 6%. So 6% will crush you. Now it's, it's a little, it's a little bit, uh, okay. So now think of the environment where we're going into. Okay. So, it's an inflationary environment. Um, they're going to re raise interest rates. Well, they, as I said, they're stuck. They, if they raise interest rates, the economy gets crippled. Small businessmen and, and uh, nobody will be able to borrow. So, you know, run small successful companies, they're going to die like flies because um, the, the cost of leverage will, um, will go up. They, they, you see, they can't raise prices as fast as inflation. There's a lag, mm -hmm. and uh, and so they they completely stuck. But you know they're gonna have to. I mean, inflation is the worst nightmare of a banker because that's their bread and butter is um, getting a regular payment. And a lot of fixed payments are um, they have fixed interest rates and stuff like that. So you'll find fixed interest rates will dry up. They'll only be variable rates. And then uh, as the quality of debt moves to variable rates, that'll allow the Fed yeah. to actually start raising rates without crippling economy. Um, it basically shifts the burden onto the, the consumer. But the, um, uh, those businesses are not going to do well in, in that environment. You go and have a look at the Weimar Republic or something and imagine that you have um, not a bakery or so, that kind of stuff doesn't exist. But imagine you have say a service company or say an accounting company or something something like that they're, they're, it's a very mixed bag which guys make it through if you part of the financial industry if you broke if one of the things that does make it is security if if you start selling guns or you start um, doing you know alarm systems for houses or something like that you'll do well but uh, you you can't you can't do a pizza parlor right because well, people you, you might you might do well as people go down market and they stop, you know, middle class stops dining in fine restaurants and starts in fast food. Then you might, you know, have a McDonald's franchise and you'll do 
do well at first, but overall, um, uh, you must expect that as the system goes down, uh, people are going for scraps. So if you make make any money at all, you'll be crowded out very quickly because there's there's no opportunity to make money. It's like Elon Musk is finding out now is that you know by you, you get into you try to get ahead of the curve and get into the latest thing. It's a big gold rush mentality, and so it, you know suddenly Elon Musk is crowded out of EVs um, because he's he's not play, he's not paying enough to the government and stuff. All that you see, Elon Musk just got dissed by Biden. He's having a little tiff with Biden. What Biden's actually doing is he's signaling to Elon that you're not paying enough in terms of campaign finance. In other words, you're not bribing the politicians enough. So it's a shakedown. So Biden, you know, had this conference with EVs and he, he invites everybody who's been paying their dues to the politicians gets invited. Elon Musk and Silicon Valley and that, these guys don't understand Washington enough. They, they shook down Zuck. Uh, that thing about Zuck and Facebook, all it is, is they, they haul him to Washington and they those Senate inquiries and stuff, all of they, all they're doing is saying, you, Sonny, are not paying your dues in, in, in campaign finance. And that's all it is. He, he just goes back from Washington and says, like, okay, how much do you want? And then starts paying it. But you see, as soon as, so, uh, so in other words, what I'm saying is, uh, it's if you find any niche, um, you will be in the position of somebody that just like hauls out a, a gold nugget out of a stream somewhere in this gold rush territory. You'll be absolutely swamped with gold rush people. So uh, the, the few people that can make money, they uh, they're selling picks and shovels to people in the in the gold rush. So if you if you do financial inf you know if you do financial advice to somebody, you could make out really well um, in in this kind of environment. But uh, you know it, a lot of alternative you know being a televangelist, a lot, all these cults and stuff like that is they're going to go wild. Um, you know a, a church is going to make more money than a company that makes widgets and stuff like that. Uh, so it's it's a very dog eat dog world, um, and so my suggestion is you really want to be out of it. You got to do everything you can. So in other words, uh, think of it like the 49ers and the San Francisco Gold Rush. It's like it's like what would you do there? Well, for one thing, you're a fucking idiot if you go out into the gold fields and start paying for gold because all of those guys are are going to starve to death. Uh, the really smart guys was. Bank of America started <laughs> with the 49ers. It was an Italian guy who said, "Like, hey, all these morons uh, think they're going to find gold. I know what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll give them thing, and then basically I'll get all the gold." And he was right. That's where Bank of America comes from. But unless you, oh, I've got, uh, I've you, got, yeah, I've got to say, sorry, I've got to interrupt you there. That's a that's a really good point because um, there is actually. Um, a cryptocurrency that exists now that ex that is doing exactly that um and it's absolutely genius um and it's called hex and it's making money out of all the short-term traders because it's rewarding long-term investors um by doing exactly that um because they're getting absolutely screwed by fees and short-termism um and that's yeah and basically everybody who is long-term is making money off the back of it. Um, it's quite a new thing, but it's like in the DeFi space. I don't know if you've heard of that, which is based off of the Ethereum uh, blockchain, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's kind of similar to what you're talking about there with the 49, with the, the people that profited off of the 49ers. Yeah, so I would put that in the category of security. So if you can sell anybody security and in, in smoothing volatility, and stuff like that is so anything we, we're talking about a very violent um, volatile situation a lot of casualties and ro road kills so in that environment what people really want is uh, security so if you if you're a scam artist uh, which is what Elon Musk and these guys are you uh, and and this kind of thing is 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 a scam because they, they won't be able to deliver that on the on the um, promise of stability. 
but people, people, stability, security, uh, anything that take you know pain relief. So any of those are um, are good, but you have to be pretty humble and you have to travel light and not get too deeply into any one of them. Um, yeah, grifters will make out well um, but if they. Yeah, I mean it's. Grift. But if you think it's. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, it's interesting you say it is a security, actually, because I, I don't know how he's done it. Um, the maths of the whole thing, it's been triple audited. It's had trip three economics audits, and it's had two coding audits, which is incredibly unusual in cryptocurrency. Most, if not all, I completely agree, are just scams and just huge, you know, it's like the Wild West in the cryptocurrency space at the moment. But... I don't know how he's done it, but he has managed to convince the uh, U.S. Um, authorities that it isn't a securities. It passed the Howey test, um, and I don't know how he's done it. He's a fucking clever guy, but um, yeah. But if you look at it, he's produced some quite good content, which explains it. But yeah, <clears throat> I, I can guess. I can I can guess straight out what's coming. So a uh, a good scam is the Black Shoals formula. So if you go and look at, he must be doing something like a version of long-term capital management. So okay. long-term capital management is is a really good thing to go and look at because long-term capital management is pretty much what's going to happen to to all these schemes. Th that was the hedge fund, wasn't it, that took out the back in was it the early 2000s, wasn't it, that, that nearly caused the financial crisis, I think, long-term capital management. It was a hedge fund. 98, it did cause the financial crisis. Yeah, it did. It actually, it stopped, it stopped the world economy for about 15 minutes. <laughs> and uh, JP Morgan and Sta Sta stepped in and saved the world, which is what they've done since the original JP Morgan. But the... Yeah, it was all these Nobel Prize laureates um, had this idea for smoothing risk, and they said basically, eventually, you know, the spread on a on a bond narrows as it heads to, heads towards maturity. So they said, you know, you can see that it's on the wrong side of the risk equation because you know that at maturity it loses all its risk, and then it just gets redeemed. So uh, the Black Shoals formula encouraged people to think that there was security in where there wasn't what the way to see it is what they called it afterwards which is vacuum like vacuuming up nickels in front of a steamroller so you know that the steamroller is coming and you go oh look there's a trading opportunity because there's like a, it's a nickel off and so you, you can you can smooth volatility on that but you see it's uh, you're selling insurance and as um as we've talked about before, is no insurance company should exist because it's irrational. Because the there'll always be some risk that you can't hedge against, even at some point in time. So you know the flippening's coming. You everybody would wipe, get wiped out. But even if you just say uh, to say the sun's going to expand and swallow Earth, <laughs> it's like this. There's no, nothing that's a reasonable insurance hedge. So insurance is fundamentally a short-term scam. And what these things are is when I say security, I mean they literally insurance. So yeah, uh, uh, you've got to be careful here because because we all we can't you can't get into these these schemes. Well, hang on a minute, maybe I should qualify myself. There were there's extra, in this collapse there are extraordinary amounts of money going around. I mean, you think of it in terms of Zimbabwe dollars, um, the the huge amounts of confetti money. Uh, transferring as it turns more and more into confetti. Um, whether you can get part of that and stuff is uh, again uh, catching a falling knife. Right? So I, I wouldn't. <laughs> okay, I, I'd say divert the, the strategy. Do do all of these little things, but I'd say the biggest thing I'd say very strongly is don't get too heavily vested in anything. Yeah, I'm, scheme or anything. Oh yeah, time. yeah. I'm I'm completely with you. I mean, I I had a like, little personal story. I was you know like, I 
I had a, um, you know, like a sort of flutter, shall we say, in like the first big run up um, back in 2017. It was it was when all these alt, they call them alternative, alt is short for alternative coins, you know, um, in, the, in the blockchain space and all this nonsense. And, you know, I, I, you know, I dabbled a bit. I was never heavily into it because I, I, luckily I found some content and listened to some people that, you know, you know, and you could, that, that was quite wise content to say, you know, this is just all, you know, and, and a lot of this money, I mean, it's happening again now. I can see it with people around me at work. They're all there on like their Coinbase app. And it's like, hang on a minute. I thought if you actually got into it in the early days, or the thing is they're like the second wave and they don't understand the whole raison d'etre of all of these things. Well, the, the dream in the clouds was, you know, this is like anti-government. It's, you know, decentralized. And yet what has happened? All of it has gone centralized. All of the exchanges are centralized. Now you've got a Bitcoin ETF and it's like all the big money is coming. If you if you had like earlier this year, you know, and you see like people like Michael Saylor and, um, you know, all the top hedge funds and all these, that you know, big money like that coming in. And Elon Musk, even that idiot, he came in and he bought it and then he sold it. So he bought it at the top. You, how many more billionaires have you got after that to buy it? But people don't really see that. They just think it's going to go to the moon. And it's like there's only so many billionaires that actually, like, you know, dabble in it. I and mean, then they can't, you know. So anyway, I'm just saying that, yeah, I, I really agree. And, and there's just so many people that get sucked into it and they don't really understand. And they're like, they're, yeah, they're just, yeah. It's the Wild West. And so, so basically, Shiny objects. And yeah, all of them all of them are scams. They seventy percent or something extraordinary are wash trades. They they spoof trades just to keep the market up. That's what they're doing. What everybody's doing. That's what they're doing with the gold and silver yeah. price. Oh, yeah. Is is they wash yeah. trades? Yeah, yeah. The ETFs in the gold market. Trade. Yeah, that's what they do all the time, isn't it? They dump them every time the gold price makes a run up. They go and then in the middle of the night they go and dump loads of ETF, uh, paper gold contracts on the market, don't they? To um, to bring the price yeah, back down. But they don't they don't have it's fraud right it's fraud they just uh, stay one step ahead of the accounts so if if you want a good fraud uh, i'll tell you a very quick and easy way to make money is you uh that any small guy can do is you go and um tell people you do training courses you write a whole lot of training material and you get a swankier you know office or something in like um tower bridge or something like that and uh and uh, you just tell people that you will tell them how to make money in the metaverse. And all the course is is you give other people training on how to make money in the metaverse. Yeah, like the yoga yeah. thing. So and people spend <laughs> and yeah, that was what was happening in 2017. It was like if you, you can pay, um, you know, some uh, few you like clever scientists, you know, coders or whatnot, you know, several. I don't know, you know, 100,000 or whatever, they'll write you, write you a nice white paper and then we get some other guy to make us a really fancy website. And then, um, you know, this is our project and this is our... <laughs> and, and it was just crazy, the amount of people that got absolutely... Oh, yeah. wrecked, you know? I, know this, this, I, know this, I know this works because they, everybody's forgotten now, but I'm, a, I'm an old enough dinosaur to remember the, the start of the internet. And at the start of the internet, everybody realized... You know, there was a scramble to get on, you know, get into the internet. Nobody really understood what the internet was, so they all just kind of um, just knew, oh, it's taking off. This is the next wave. And so the, the guys that made the most money were guys that that gave courses on how to make money on the internet, and people would pay three grand, ten grand for these courses, especially if they're in nice locations. And, uh, and all the course was is a pyramid scheme. You, you, you just give people all the materials so they start up their own business selling, telling people how to start. And that's it. You don't, you don't tell people how to – you get what the scam is. You don't tell people how to, how to make money on the Internet. You just sell a franchise of businesses telling or purporting to tell you how to make money on the Internet. And as long as – you know, until everybody realizes it's just a permit scheme, you can make a bunch of money, especially if you arrange it like Amway or something like that. Right. Yeah, I yeah. want to go back to the, the debt. So, so you, that, well, you mentioned, 
Hugh, you mentioned the the that six percent will eat you alive and this kind of thing, and that's true. Uh, if you get fixed fixed rate debt, um, one that's that's a uh, and and you have other people paying it for you. So if you are um, being an asshole, uh, like uh, uh, landlord or um, you know business owner, um, basically everything that uh, anarchists don't like, <laughs> then um, uh, then you can use um, debt, fixed rate debt, uh, intelligently to. Um, multiply your oh, yeah. return on, a, on cash on cash return. Yeah, but it depends who you are. You see, the, this is how the hedge funds got rich. If you want to see how where the hedge funds came from, the the books like uh, Barbarians at the Gates and stuff like that, and they they were like KKK and all of these guys. What K K R? What they did was what they still do. I. Oh yeah, KKK. Oh, that's right. Uh, KKK is something different, but close, close enough. Um, KKR, uh, yeah, Kravitz and the like rip off. I can't remember what they are. But anyway, they they, uh, they came from Ivan Bosky and these guys. And what they they it, it's all a scam, but it's it's what everybody's doing. This is how everybody's getting rich. Uh, Bezos and all the rest of them. Everybody, even to GE. Anybody, but but uh, because they got in earliest, State Street, Vanguard, and BlackRock are the kings of this game. But what they do is, um, what they just did to Toys R Us, is they uh, they do a leverage buyout. That means that they go to a bank, and the, the bank's in on this game. So they always get their money because they, they know what the game is. So uh, they, they do a hostile takeover. They, they buy the company from all the shareholders, take in effect, take it private sometimes, but it still works if you keep it public. But you go to a public company, you bribe all the stockholders, and you say you offer them extraordinary money. It's money. It's the bank's money, and you say, well, you know, why? Why do the shareholders take it? It's because you offer something like double what stock prices. So they all greedy, greedy bastards. They all take the money. So now you've got this company with like a shitty amount of debt. And you say, well, you know, how do you repay all that debt? You don't have that debt. You pass that debt on to the company like Toys R Us. So effectively, Toys R Us are crippled. So how does the hedge fund make money? Out of fees, the same way the bank does. You see, to do, to I remember my dad telling me this long ago. He said, if you want to make extraordinary amounts of money, uh, the way to do it is you put together a large deal. So in other words, you you find you figure out some amazing deal of saying like a property deal or some kind of merger or some kind of you know international thing. But you get like three entities, put them together. If you're the guy that does, you can take like a third of the result. It's like ridiculous. If you if you got three of the biggest companies in the world. Um, and put and made the deal where they all merge. Effectively, you as an individual can walk away with something like that. You could instantly become the richest guy in the world just by that. And so that's in effect what they were doing. They take all these fees and all the, the excess, and then they they pile the the target company. It's called you know a, a raid. Uh, so it's, they're doing corporate raiding. Uh, they just pile it with debt. Toys R Us goes down the tubes, and then it, all the you know, all the press and stuff, they all touch and say, oh, well, it's because Amazon and Toys R Us are falling behind because, you know, they, everybody's buying online and they'll have a million reasons other than what actually happened. But the financial net press never exposes that game. And the guys just go on to the next thing. So then you take all that money that you made and then you do a bigger raid until it, now they're running out of things to raid. They're raiding whole countries. Greece is, was, a, was in fact a debt raid. So they, the the game has gone on. So you know they they're running out of mammoths to to bring down. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> they they get money very very cheap, very cheap. They they some of these guys like Mitt Romney, I think he gets zero percent loans. If you if you get a zero percent loan, it's like fuck it, man. What can't you do? What what could stop you getting becoming the richest person? And, you give me a zero percent loan of a billion dollars, I'll overtake Musk in a year or two. Easy. <laughs>
and I'll, yeah. I'll have it on the on YouTube. Yeah, that's the, the so that that private those kind of private equity deals or the uh, leveraged buyouts they're usually at the large figure level. So they are running out of mammoths, but there are plenty of of uh, you know um, rabbits and antelopes left. Um, so I, I think that's where oh. I'm talking about the uh, for the people in this group uh, at some point. Um, you know, maybe we could uh, look into uh, doing a a smaller um, buyout of say a private security company that that does what anarchists want. Uh, of you know, if instead of the police have a private security company or something like that, uh, which is making money. Um, and uh, I think that that's a, um, the, the other thing is just the uh, real estate. If there's cash flowing real estate, you can borrow against it and, um, and, and accelerate your money far faster than your, um, you would get in a stock market um, return. So the, the, um, the idea is to get in actual cash flowing assets. So if you have a, if you have a home, uh, and you're living in it, that's not an asset. That's a liability to you because it's taking money out of your pocket. It, Hugh, your boat is, is a liability, right? It's not an asset. Um, same with anybody who owns their home. But I think that, uh, if you, if you're able to make, the things you buy pay you every month, then those are assets that that you can accumulate over time, and that that will compound um, much faster. So it's maybe not the best advantage for taxes, but uh, that's that's where you're you're talking about investing rather than speculating. This is what Robert Kiyosaki said, isn't it? That's the yeah. rich dad, poor dad guy, all of that business. Yeah, I mean, it makes complete sense. Yeah. Yeah, and and the thing is that they don't the uh, the rich people don't don't pay taxes because they they just use uh, loans to to have their to live off of, so they'd rather pay the interest rate on the loan even if it's six percent, uh, and have it be backed by the assets they have, yeah. uh, than than to pay the the actual taxes on the on the money because loans are tax free. No, no, they 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 don't. Uh... They don't pay interest, so so um, they could pay negative interest. If if Elon Musk goes and takes a loan, he could very well pay something like minus two percent. They would pay him to take the, the loans, and you might think that's bizarre, but the reason is they go to the derivatives market and they they pass on the debt, so they 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 can't get enough debtors, and so they 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 will. I mean. If you if you wonder how these guys get rich is like I mean they can't not it's kind of like Brewster's millions for them because um, they they have to fend off people that want want to you know pay them to take a loan. In fact, uh, I I don't have a lot of um, faith in anything that takes years to build up or something. I think we've got like a very short time horizon. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing that that would work is. Um, is is consolidating debt if you go down to you know guys with student loans and guys with you know underwater um that's going to be a big deal so if you if you buy up all the debt and do do that game that, that would work you, you can definitely uh you know pass on the debt uh, hypothecate it um also, um you know okay i'll tell you something which now could get me sent to prison on this uh, call. Okay, so how do I describe it? Um, okay, imagine, okay, well, here's a plot for a book I'm writing. Okay, so in this book, there are a bunch of anarchists, right? What they do is they set up a financial corporation, maybe with the backing of some rich boomer who wants to take down the system. Now, in my book, completely fictional, you understand. These anarchists then go and buy up all the student debt, right? So they, they buy up all the student debt in this company, and then they collapse. <laughs> Do you get it? Yeah. See, 
if, if, if it wasn't fiction, I would be sent to jail for fraud by telling you this, because that would be fraudulent. But if, if it just happened naturally and they didn't intend it, then basically it's 1.9 trillion in debt. If you went to and said to every single guy that you can find with a student loan, say, what's your student loan? Oh, I've got a hundred thousand pounds. You say, okay, um, how much do you have? Because um, I will take on that entire loan for whatever money you have. And they'd say, well, I've got a car. I say, well, sell that car and I'll take on the debt. And you've, you've got a job. You could probably go and get, get another car, a uh, better one uh, for finance. In fact, we will help you with that. And then you say, okay, you sign over the debt. So now uh, Anarchy Inc. has got a debt of 100,000. It's got a small cash flow, cash income from a thousand bucks for this this guy, and um, the guy goes off and gets a loan for a car, and then anarchy in crumbles. That's what that's what they're doing, all, all over in them in the stock market. That's that's how uh, they're getting rid of their debts. That's how the banks are getting rid of their debts. But you see, Basically, nobody on just... the left and stuff. These guys all knives. Just call the call the company uh, Greece, and you <laughs> you got the same situation. In, in effect, that's what they were doing with Greece, right? So, well, Greece. Well, if they'd listened to Varoufakis, they would have done that. Um, the, that's what, what a company a country does when it you can't plan a default. That's illegal for obvious reasons. But you see, there's so much debt that's immoral um and you see what guy you see the debt um i tried to explain this to uh, i won't go into that but anyway you can't get this wrong you see uh, it's it's very dangerous to have a little bit of knowledge right so i think that like gail and stuff like that she ran into this we tried to convince them about a debt strike they didn't understand it and now she's got believe she's got she's facing a, a charge of fraud it's a very serious charge way way worse than gluing your tits to the road um, because it's far more dangerous you see, see what happened with debt um, is, uh, the whole system is because we're all debt slaves um, they don't they don't have live slave markets anymore they have um, you know they sell your chains your chains in, in an open market and without the debt slave even knowing about it. So it's not like P Steven Pinker says, like, oh, we've got liberation and stuff. No, they perfected slavery. They, they, they're still slave auctions. It's just the slaves don't even know. They don't even appear. That's all. It's just they just got cleverer at running the slave market. So what uh, happens is that... Uh, sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, to make to, I'd say, is that to do with the birth certificate thing? Because that's what a lot of people have been delving into. I've, I've heard of this before, and it's like, yeah, there's something going on there in the government, like to do with, as you say, like uh, almost label options. Oh, well, no, I mean, um, as, soon as, as soon as you're given a social security number or a, t a tax number, you, you're essentially. Yeah, social <laughs> security <laughs> number is your <laughs> cell number. Social security number is your cell number. Right. Hey. It's it's your tattoo on the arm, so so what what uh, so but but anyway well the the important thing to know about this and especially for activists on the left and who aspire to actually change is do financial change. So okay so but anyway what happened in the slave market is they needed liquidity of a slave so it's like nobody would would buy somebody else's debt because it's like fuck it's like. You're only going to sell the debt if it's a hot potato. So, so knowing this, governments responding to their owners, which are the financiers, passed all over the world, by the way, starting in Britain, they passed sweeping and deep legislation. This is rooted in the, in the legal system uh, all over the, the capitalist world. In fact, even communist world is, is that they, the, they tried to make the debt market very liquid, um, something that's naturally illiquid because no one can trust debt. Is, uh, and, and to do that, they, they said that if you pass on a debt, 
uh, the person that receives that, that debt um, has far, far more rights than the orig original debtor. So I can sign a, a loan agreement with some SAP, and it can be relatively mild. Without the knowledge of that SAP, and this is what everybody that gives you debt does, by the way, because of this, is if I go then to some third party that you've never fucking heard of, and I sell the debt onto him, he suddenly gets extraordinary rights. He can have your kids to the fifth generation and, you know, search and seizure. Basically, you, you have the rights of uh, a drug dealer going through customs uh, for the guy that I sell it to. So, and, and you don't even have to know or agree. And all debt can be... Uh, be passed yeah, on. yeah. This is this is the, what happened. The in banks won't let you pass the debt on, right? The this banks won't let let you uh, sell, sell your debt on, but they immediately sell it on as fast as they can. Th this is what's happened and, in and the, the UK. All the mortgages. This is the um, we, we've got. There's a few people in the UK who are actually taking the banks through the ringer now. Um, particularly Santander, which is a Spanish bank, um, and he because he. He managed to, over years and years, this chap, um, he basically just kept challenging them because he knew that what was happening, when you when you actually delve into the terms and conditions of the mortgage, it's all just being sold on. Like his, you know, like they're just making absolute killing, you know, by creating these, you know, derivatives. Um, I think that's what you're talking about. And and he was, um, basically, he, he was sent a, a screen dump, a shot that showed that, that they um, in the mortgage contract they became the um, uh, the attorney. Um, so uh, people are unwittingly signing away their life. Essentially, you know, when they're not, they're not. Um, they don't have power of attorney. It's essentially, the bank ends up with power of attorney, and this is incredibly powerful because then, so so when people are signing these contracts, like anything, they're not reading it and they're not understanding. But it allows the banks to just yeah get away with murder um i'm not very good at explaining it but i'm sure you're familiar with with that kind of well i think that correlates to what you're talking about yeah yeah it's especially something like a non non-recourse debt or something that has uh, repo rights and stuff like that but you see what people don't understand is when they get into debt is they go to a nice uh, little lender and agree and agree agree their terms of um of of slavery, I'm not realizing that the the slave owner that they're selling themselves to is uh, has no intention of hanging on to them as slaves for more than a nanosecond. Um, that they're going to dump them as well. You see, the reason why people don't know this is they're careful to name ad themselves as administrator. So the if you go to Halifax or NatWest or whatever, they they will Lloyd's Bank. They 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 will be careful to put something in is that they become the administrator of the loans after they sold it on. So that why they do that is that they can maintain the fiction to you that, you know, I mean, the game would fall apart if everybody knew what they did behind the scenes. So in to they pretend that they s still, um, you know, they send, send you letters with the Lloyds Bank um, uh, header on it and stuff like that. But, but, uh, the letterhead um, is just there to maintain the fiction that, um, that so that the public thinks that they're still indebted to Lloyd's Bank. But uh, if ever you have a legal case or anything, you'll quickly find out that Lloyd's Bank steps out of the picture and you're dealing with some uh, this you know rat's nest of fucking thieves, um, and and so you'll be crushed. But the, yeah, it's, but see, it, it's, it goes both ways. Right? It's all to do with that people don't know how to stand because if you stand as a physical human being, I mean, to put it in its layman's terms, from what I understand, there's commercial law, which is the law of the sea. So the law of the sea is the you know that's you, you stand in you know you you stand in a um, a dock right that's where a ship's docked and it's all everything there is like you're dead. You're on the sea. You're dead in the debtor's prison, as you say. It's all like from commercial. It's it's, it's kind of fascinating because it's all, yeah, it's the law of the sea, isn't it? But it's all comes from that. So so yeah, if you stand as if you know how to stand in those situations, then you can play it. But if you don't, then you automatically admit that yeah, you are dead and you are that person that you signed on that bit of paper. And you know, it all goes back to this um, 
like Justinian, doesn't it? You know, with all uh, our, our surnames. Like we didn't used to have surnames, and that was something that was given to everybody that, that denotes your who you are as a slave, doesn't it? It's it's kind of yeah, fascinating and quite scary once you start looking yeah, through all that stuff. But <laughs> the Venetian started this, so it's the reason why they uh, what they called banks is uh, that's. Um, a bench it's the italian banco for bench and the reason is because the venetian money lenders um basically would lend money over a bench um you know outside um you know kind of a bar table uh but that's why shakespeare wrote the merchant of venice fortunately instead of telling you know people what the game is and they they tell people in school that like you can tell from the merchant of venice that uh, shakespeare is an anti-semite and you know we could dismiss him and stuff and say like okay forget about the anti-semitism go and look what he's telling you about the fucking merchant of venice is where this game was invented was in venice but it it, it got into a high gear when um, the doc right the dutch uh, east india company uh, may, that's where the relationship to shipping came in because it was done for arbitrage to the to the West Indies, and uh, everything, insurance and stuff, it all came from these syndicates getting together to pull their money. And in fact, what I'm saying is, what we should do is the ext extinctionity, is that the the rich guys who pulled their money to invest in the ship, um, and then insurance came about because they had to share the risk of uh that the ship might be lost because so many were lost um but you know anybody that signs on to one of those ships they screwed because we're, you know right up until today with filipinos and piano lines or any one of these other uh, carnival cruises or anything it's the same old game is they they pay them nothing and they they make them accumulate debt while they they're on board so the old trick that they did to press gang sailors and stuff is they would give them all the equipment and clothes and food and they would all be signing for it as they went in the ledger, not realizing that it's been taken out of their pay. So they, they would often get to the destination think, okay, you owe us more than you're going to earn in the next year. And they'd go, how come? And I said, well, look, you signed for all this shit that you had, bread, <laughs> meat, clothes boots <laughs> you know how much that shit costs well it costs a hell of a lot on this ship in fact if you had bought them in port it would have cost you a tenth of the cost but they had centuries of that that nobody came back and said don't get on the ship it's a fucking scam but um that yeah that's it still goes on today even on ships but all of these games they all got elaborated that's what these stupid shits like like Pinker never get is they cannot see that what is none of the violence went away it just went underground it got more subtle and it's worse that if, if you just mugged somebody in the street it's far less than the mugging that Lloyd's Bank will give you over your fucking lifetime with a mortgage they don't put mortgage it has the word mort in it for a fucking good reason <laughs> right but you see the thing is nobody ever again probably not many people are going to like this video because it's boring they they always done the same thing they bored everybody to death it's basically you, they talk about the banality of evil and guys are not, like eichmann no it's the banality of banking that they made banking and finance so banal and so much like root canal therapy that basically nobody can look at it without falling asleep and that's their protection it's basically they, it's it's almost like a, a vampire bat, you know. I know vampire bats don't actually anesthetize the things. That's a myth, but but in effect, there's I think maybe one or two mice. But anyway, what a vampire bat does is, is mythically it's supposed to anesthetize the host with saliva and stuff like that that it's has that's uh, anesthetic. Uh, and and that's what the guys are doing. They, they, you know, the whole subject. So even if you talk about like to Extinction Rebellion about a debt rebellion and consolidating debt and defaulting, <laughs> which I want to do because that would be illegal. But um, you know, they, it, it's too boring a subject. It's, it's far more sexy to cop and you know do all you know all this fucking stupid stuff. But you see, the police crimes bill. 
yeah uh, it's like give me a fucking call and and but the problem is yeah you can't pick and choose because you don't know what the fuck you're doing and this is complicated so if anybody wants to give me a call to say how can you do activism like this and it's like is a you know uh well it's difficult a because people haven't got a fucking clue you have the problem with the fact is they don't believe it they don't mean you know it's like oh you know it's a joke it's a joke on stephen colbert oh you know tinfoil hat they're farming us ha 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 what a dipshit it's like no, they're fucking farming us. It's like the, the way they get away with it is because you think, oh, there's no conspiracies. <laughs> I'm I'm going to make a success and I'm going to be a fucking Nobel Prize laureate and stuff. And uh, yeah, you're a fucking idiot. You really are being fucking duped. And, and but so so activists can't do this because somewhere along the line, you have to tell people. This thing that you're a sheep, you stuff like and you know, but but you are a right wing conspiracy theorist. So it's like literally just like trying to herd cats. So it's it, so in essence, once you understand that that slavery is the modern version of slavery. In fact, the old version of slavery was dead. All the way, way to get to America and, and wind up on a plantation was to run up debts in Africa. It's basically nobody went running into the wilds of Africa to try and round up poor black people and put them on slave ships and send them to the Americas. They went to the coast and bought them. Why? From other bastards, Africans, who were selling their mates. They never, no white person took a step into Africa to get a slave. The Arabs did. But they generally get Arabs. Why did everybody allow the Arabs to run around in burqas, you know, taking all their family into custody because of debt. Everybody agreed with it. Everybody, you see the culture and everybody said, it's like, well, you ran up the debt. So, you know, look at the fine print. Yeah. It said, if you can't pay your debts, you get taken bodily into slavery. So get on the ship. And like, nobody says that. They say it's colonialism and white people, you know, yes, stolen sir. from Africa into a bullshit. <sighs> Africans sent you there because they bought into the debt system and sold you stupid fucks racism's got nothing to do with it sophie you're muted this is still happening because i have worked with people who have arrived from africa and their families out there are indented with the debt um that they, these people had to get to to get across to to get to pay a, a, a trafficker to get them to to europe or wherever and over there their their family are working for nothing to pay for the the slave that's gone to Europe and their slaves in their own country because of that. It's just, it, it hasn't changed. It's still going on. Yeah, all, all the guys in the Middle East, right? All the workers that are putting up, when, when you, when you see these fantastic things like this, you know, uh, Bin Laden, not Bin Laden, the, the um, uh, Bonsor, and Bandan and these guys, that, that city that the guys are building there in Saudi and stuff. You know, you read in the, the highest this and the biggest that and desalination and glass and EVs and flying cars and stuff. And it's like, they never mention that all those little ants, building that they, they're all slave labor. They've all come from like um, everywhere from Mali to Malaysia. And the reason why they're working on their bills the guys are holding their fucking passports they would they would go home if they could and they well actually they wouldn't go home if they could because because the the guys in at their home would probably beat the shit out of them because they, they were sent there to make money often by their fathers and stuff so it's like yeah they can't go home because they'd go home in disgrace and get an ass with them if they're lucky so it's it's like slavery is is far darker than than, than you uh, realize. But part, a large part of slavery is what Kanye West said. Kanye West said the most important things that African Americans ever, ever heard, and they need to sew this on their fucking pillows. Kanye West said, Ab truth and get over it. You get over it. Listen, Kanye West said the guys were slaves because they submitted to slavery. The slaves fault he is right he's absolutely 
fucking right. But more than that, it's not the, the slave, the slammy. They bought into that system. They bought into the idea that you, you allow debts. If you can't pay your debts, somebody can seize you bodily. All of the stuff that we still do today. If you can't pay your debts now, you call it a deadbeat dad, and you call it a, a this pejorative and a that pejorative, and uh, you know, you you everybody in the in the slave labor, they contribute to the slavery because they anybody that defaults on debt and stuff is a pariah. So it's like that's what happened in Africa. That's what Kanye West is talking about. Is that this everybody cheered this this enslavement of their own brothers? Because they they had this this uh, primate brain dead instinct, they used our primate brain to to um, our alien cortex used the shoes of our our primate brain and our primate brain particularly its instinct for debt and debt obligation. So in Germany, debt is called guilt or something like that, but it means guilt. And one of the reasons why the Germans are very averse to debt is because the word is guilt and it has the same connotations. One of the reasons why the Industrial Revolution um, took off in Britain is the, the debt wasn't such a pejorative, unfortunately. But anyway, don't forget that slaves contribute to their slavery largely by buying into the debt system. So anyway, if you want to get out of it, Slaves can buy their own debt if they all, you know, pull together, buy their own debt, and default. Well, that's illegal. But what the fuck they're gonna do, man? So anyway, uh, well, th that's probably a good place to stop unless anybody's got anything more to say. But um, I must say that we can't let this topic go because this is the very first hurdle you have to know negotiate an extinction is, is you have to in this collapse where all these morons are running around the financial system i mean evergrand has just reneged on its debt right this like it's, nobody knows what china's going to do nobody knows if china has the money to mop this up but it's that's the lehman brothers moment it's just how much <laughs> how much uh, political will and capital does uh, China have or the CCP have to bail, bail them out? Gonna bail out. And uh, property crumbles in China. <laughs> You're going to see it on the shelves in Saints. So, so here's the, the other thing is, is this is all opaque. Nobody knows what goes on, has the faintest clue what goes on in it's like a shadow with derivatives market and stuff nobody really knows who's indebted to who all you know it's a it's a gang of thieves, and everybody's uh in it up to the elbows it's uh, it's going to collapse because you know it's just it's an unviable slave market where you see what they've done is they've sold the chains that you have around your neck on many times so in other words they they count this they count the chains i've said this in one of my videos they count the chains and not the slaves so they're running out of necks right to put the chains on but the the, the false accounting is done because they don't account for the necks they don't account for how many people there are and how, how they can't can never pay it back so if you look at tesla it would take the pe ratios for tesla would take a thousand years i heard it would take uh, Tesla a thousand years to 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 buy back what what its market cap is. So it's like, it's uh, the only way it works is if they they're not counting Tesla, they're counting the the chains, the derivatives <laughs> that are sold on. <laughs> and so it's like, but the chains don't pay any money. It's the the, the slave with a neck that 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 works and and returns money. So you can't count the chains and say, oh, you know, I've got. I've got a thousand slaves. Why? Look, I've got a thousand chains. You say, what's at the end of the chain? Oh, there's only a, this, this one slave. Like all those chains in the world are on this one slave's neck. And everybody's saying, I'm rich. I've got a thousand slaves. No, you've got a thousand chains on one slave's neck. And that's, that's the problem. That's, that's why this system's going to fail soon. The necks have all disappeared due to the virus. Haha, <laughs> just a joke. But I was uh, going to uh, appreciate uh, Ryan for uh, bringing up um, all the 
illusions we have and the propaganda that we get uh because the as you say the finance thing is just a lot of smoke and mirrors and it's unfortunate that um it's very labyrinthine and there are like all kinds of games you know like all kinds of planners you can go to so that you can plan like backdoor from your uh, traditional Roth into your Roth IRA so that you can um, not be penalized by the required minimum distribution. So it's all just a big game and people are not sophisticated enough to, to know all the rules. And then, like you said, people's eyes glaze over when we talk about um, finances, rules, regulations, um, and there's a lot of propaganda about um, distracting us. And um, so anyway, I wanted to appreciate what Ryan said. But at the same time, I wanted to maybe, like you said, for future uh, meetings to go into the addressing. Because what Ryan, I think, was uh, kind of a building is a, like a proposal of some kind of um, anarchist, um, I don't know, like business venture or something that cash flows. But maybe that's one approach. But as you said, it might be too late if it takes a long time to get benefits. Um, it's hard to evaluate businesses um, that cash flow. But maybe there are other options to prepare, like for this financial collapse, like self-employment, for instance. You know, if you you go to plumber school and take two years, and you know you're, you know, uh, like you said, something like that. That's probably more achievable for um, regular folk who are not high finance dealers. Yeah, or else, I, I, you or else, like what you suggested earlier, we start courses for people to tell yeah. what, how you make money during the collapse. We'll have <laughs> online demos of how to survive the flippening. <laughs> well, one one thing I would highly recommend is going uh, and having a look at the other crises. So, if you have a, a look at, say, uh, Argentina and stuff like that, is um. Uh, the, what, uh, look at what those guys did. One of the things they did was have uh, uh, buyers clubs or not buyers clubs, the trading clubs. But in, in essence, they would have their own uh, economy and with their own currency, just kind of a, a, a fake currency or something. But they, you know, they would buy warehouses and then people would exchange and trade um, with this. Uh, Local currency, you know, like, a co -op, like a co-op co with local yeah. currency. Yeah, but everybody everybody paid to just uh, have a stall in, say, inside the warehouse, very little, and then they essentially um, just traded these tokens. Um, and then it was mainly things that craft things and veggie stuff that people could... could yeah, they have that in Bristol. Yeah, the... Bristol pound, um, I think. I don't know if it's still yeah. there, but yeah, it's a very, it's a, yeah, that's like quite established. I think that's been going for years. <laughs> yeah, like small market, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I, yeah that, so, that's what I intended with Geodo is to to do something like the Bristol pound that you could use on a cell phone. But yeah, I mean, I, I would still like to revive all of that if uh, if you could get enough people involved but I, I still uh hang on to the dream that that we can do something as a collective we can find a way the simpler the better to actually support all of us um together as a mutualist community ar around the world um i would love to do that um but um pooling stuff i think I, that that's the way to get through all of this is uh you can't see everybody wants to find a winning strategy the fact you're trying to find a winning strategy is a loser's gambit so you you have to accept that no one knows um so so you do what the the doc did you know all those syndicates is you pool your resources and then you say well somebody's going to pull through so if you have a big enough group of people that are smart enough somebody goes through and pays for all the rest but again it's a nine out of ten thing and so what what brian was saying is you know the venture capitalists they if you ask any venture capitalist in silicon valley they'll tell you that they do 10 investments they expect eight to fail uh they they expect um one to be the bastard and not 
not break through and neither die, which is the worst of all for them. They hate that because it's a time suck. And then the thing that pays for all, all of the 10 is one success. And, and so those guys are experts in, you know, horse trading or identifying successful slaves uh, or entrepreneurs. And, and they, and they can't tell out of 10, they don't expect to get one right. And they can't tell in advance. They do, they do fantastic due diligence. And the experts cannot get it more than one in 10 right. So you, you take that as an individual and you have to say, like, you've got nine chances out of 10 that you're going to fuck up. So, but the 10th is always knock it out the park thing. So that's what I'm saying for the extinction Nazi is if you have 10% of members of the extinction Nazi make out like bandits, they can easily cover the rest. But what you can't say is like, what's the winning strategy? Everybody wants to know what the winning strategy is. I said, first, get rid of that thought. <laughs> that thought that there's a winning strategy is the fundamental road killer. Yeah. I, I do have, um, uh, I'll, I'll leave you guys with uh, uh, an idea, which is uh, geo arbitrage. So um, rather than maxing out your HSA and um, using one of these government programs, uh, I think that if you spend over 330 days outside of the U.S., if you're a U.S. taxpayer, then uh, over $110,000 uh, of your money can be uh, tax exempt if it's earned income. So uh, that every year, the U.S. pays me 40 grand, essentially, to get the fuck out. So I... Uh, I think there's. Uh, yeah, it pays you back, right? Pays, you, pays me back. I don't it have. Pays you back. You tax first. Yeah. You tax first. I get taxed and first, and then they pay me pay back. back. So they are getting the zero, zero uh, interest loan. <laughs> but yeah. Well, well there's an in okay. So here's an interesting um, idea: is uh, if you look at the possibilities for remote working, they're becoming more and, and uh, more and more possible so especially something like the extinction audio that's kind of distributed and especially like my pirate fleet is that is uh, you can work from anywhere now and uh, people don't know it yet so so it's quite you know especially with uh, everybody working from home and lockdowns and stuff like that is uh, from 2020 it was a golden opportunity to leave so you know you like like Ryan was saying is like yeah, you know, Ryan was spending like 40k. Um, it was fine 40k for just if you'd been in the states. So if if you, if you just work from a boat in the med <laughs> and uh, telecommute, um, they're paying you 40k straight away to do that. And year on year for uh, however many years and, that that adds up. So uh, it's a, uh, um, yeah, in. Uh, instead of an HSA, go to another country where you can pay cash for a medical procedure and it's just as good. Um, and uh, it hardly makes a dent compared to, to um, you know, the expenses elsewhere. But, so it's, um, if, you, if you really want to optimize your taxes as a, as a U.S.ican, that's that's the way. Um, but for people who have residence-based taxation systems, just leave your country um, and keep traveling, and um, you can maybe get a tax residence somewhere that that uh, doesn't um, tax you so much. But uh, but yeah, if you if you're doing this nomadic perpetual traveler thing, and you can find a way to position yourself to be uh, getting remote active income, uh, that's a that's a huge uh, benefit for um, the the health financial health of the of the extinction uh, uh, Do I'll you have some resources? Uh, uh, so, oh, sorry. I was just going to say. I remember you said before, Ryan, that you had some resources on that kind of um, yeah, like emigration or like remote working or just perpetual traveling. Be cool if you could post some. I don't have your email address. I'm not sure if it was on the list. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, we can talk in Discord on, on the, anything in, 
in particular. Uh, but it, yeah, there's. Um, it depends on what you want. I, I have. Um, uh, if it's you know buying a citizenship or something, then I I do have resources on that as well as um, other uh, other kinds of. Yeah, uh, I think it'd just be helpful. Yeah, all, all of what you have. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'll have to have a look. I'll contact well, you on that. Well, can I can I make a suggestion that people are going to hate? Is um, do you mind writing a book? <laughs> Me <laughs> accumulate some. Yeah, accumulate Royalties. some knowledge. Um, so basically you do the, the Extinction Arties Guide to Sovereignty or something like that. So you do the sovereign individual, but um, tips on, on how to, how to uh, do remote work. And th there's, there are a lot of resources online for people that are starting to get the idea. But I'll, I'll tell you one of them, uh, just one before we end, and that's um, medical in America. Um, you can take advantage of that scam. In, in Greece or other European countries, um, um, healthcare at, at the state facility is a uh, hundred euros for the year. So a hundred euros gets you medical coverage um, at the state level, which is pr pretty good <laughs> outside of a pandemic. Um, for a hundred euros. Now in America, that would cost you about a couple of grand a month, and if you've got a prior condition or anything. They'll service you very well in most European countries, um, even as an expat or somebody that's bought into the system. So it's like, the uh, you know, if if you have station and you're being fucked over by medication or something by the states, you should seriously consider um, doing uh, telecommuting and saving all that money and getting on some state system. The the state, by the way, would would love you to buy a residency there because they, they want the cash and then you get the, the tax benefits. But um, yeah, I mean, this is what uh, the, the rich people um, have armies of people telling them how to save money, which is kind of ironic because they're the least, the ones that need to save money the least. Um, but I, th I think as a community effort, we could certainly tell people how to arrange finances and do creative stuff because, you know, What's going to happen is the guys are going to be coming down the hills from the gold rush, um, you know, poverty, full of poverty and destitution, and you want to be able to to help them out and give them pointers. So it could be a growing project and a growing body of knowledge of how to negotiate, negotiate the the crash all the way to the flipping and back to monkey. I, I think that's why we have to remember what you said in the previous meeting about the importance of being open between us on what we can offer to those people and, and uh, welcoming as many people as you can in your boats or houses or hideouts or whatever you have, uh, because that is that is something that we, we can pool um, because we are an international group and we've got all sorts of different locations. In actuality, among my peers, um, part of the golden handcuffs is uh, they think they have a gold-plated health insurance. And so that's why, you know, people of my generation don't want to quit work is if they have what they presume is good health insurance until the time comes when there's some weird disease they have that even the health insurance will not cover. So um, I think what Ryan was proposing about, and you also, uh, Hugh, about um, alternatives to getting medical care in, um, in other countries uh, would be very beneficial. Thanks also, Sophie, for all the comments about, you know, offering each other. Yeah, and I, I would add to this that, I mean, I'm not working anymore. I'm just, I'm a, I'm a poor <laughs> gardener. But I offer free advice to ex-patients because they're being fucked up by the system. And sometimes they come to see me and we have a chat about, how they've been messed up and stuff like that. So I've done it a few times online too for some people. So I, I'm happy also to freely um, give health advice and whatever you want. I mean, I'm really not um, much in the system, but I, I, I've got my knowledge and my experience uh, to, to share. So uh, you never know, like, you know.
Thank but you, Sophie. Can you write prescriptions? I can, I manage, yeah, because I know the pharmacist because I can't afford to pay my registration to the medical council anymore because they want to ask me for an annoyance. But I, I don't care because they know me around here. So, yeah, I can write prescriptions. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> awesome. That's useful. Yeah, very. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, yeah, they are. the other thing uh, that I know is that there, there are a lot of um, uh, old people are, uh, you know, taking cruises, uh, perpetual cruises, uh, because I think I mentioned this before, on these cruise ships like, you know, Holland America and Carnival and p and and stuff, they, they have great medical care uh, because it's really bad publicity to have, you know, most, most of the customers are geriatric. And it's, it's they don't. It's very bad publicity to have geriatric people dying on your cruise. So they they have like gold-plated, top-notch medical facilities, better than most hospitals on these cruise ships, and uh, it's free. <laughs> and so it, the cruise ships are kind of like uh, Las Vegas. It's kind of the room is almost free because they try and shake you down in the gambling in the theater and the restaurants and stuff. So they they get you as a captive. Uh, with this bait and switch so they try and get you on board with this ridiculously low package holiday on a cruise liner and then they try to shake you down later but if you don't go in it'll just like vegas you can get a free room and you never go to the gambling and the restaurants and the shows and stuff so then it's a net lot of them and then you go and like go on their medical they 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 know that a lot of people are abusing it but uh they they don't really care because they there are enough uh, people to pay to pay their way and they don't they don't want to spoil a good thing but i i think uh the fact when the cruise ships close down they cost people a lot of the free medical care. <laughs> fair, fair warning um for people who are trying to get the foreign earned income exclusion um in the u.s tax system if you are on a cruise liner um that counts as like a day in the u.s for the 330 days outside of the u.s so you only get 30 days. Um, so if what you go on a cruise, you should ship? miss it. Miss the 40 grand. Um, no, no, but if, if you go on like an Italian cruise ship or something, then you're on foreign soil, right? Uh, if it, as long as it's on foreign soil, it, it has to be in a foreign government. So it's... Yeah, if it's, but it's it, easy. Yeah. No, no, it's easy to find a, a cruise liner that's not American. Um, no, it... If it goes into international waters, that counts as a day in the U.S. Uh, no, but if you if you are under a foreign flag and you're cruising the Caribbean, you're out of the U.S. Surely. Uh, yeah, it, as long as you can document it that it's in in the uh, in a in which government's waters it's in, then you're okay. Yeah, but it's easy to document it on a cruise. Yeah. Just just making it clear, it has to be in a foreign exactly. government. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, basically, ships and planes um, are sovereign territory wherever they go. Um, I'm, I'm a little slice of sovereign territory, and that, that's one of the reasons why you have to ask permission to board a boat, which <laughs> no, it's basically crossing an international boundary. Anyway, um, yeah, anybody, anybody got anything else? Let's round it off there. All righty, all right, let's uh, just pause, let go. Lots of things to think about, but let's just put them aside and for still come to a fine point of attention. Om Paramatmane Nama Iti. All right. Have a good week. You got one more week before the uh, the solstice. All right. That's About right. Nine days before the solstice. Yeah.
I won't see you next weekend. That I'll, uh, I'll be there for the following one. Okay, bye bye. Yeah. Thank don't, you very much. Don't forget the solstice, though. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have a nice weekend next weekend. All right. Bye, Thank everybody. You and goodbye.